kind of a sad day. We're going to be ending the Undeceivable Sermon Series today. It, isn't that sad? I'll say that again, and you be ready this time. It's a sad day. We're going to end the series. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, we're going to end the series. Next week, I'm going to be preaching to you. I'm going to start preaching. Probably take me maybe one or two uh, Sundays to talk about this, uh, how to make sure your spiritual drift is in the right direction. We're drifting you know, life has a way of ebbing and flowing, but to make sure you're drifting in the right direction, not the wrong direction, some very practical advice on how to make sure you're drifting closer to God and not away from God. So that's exciting, isn't it? Relevant? Amen. Amen. Nudge the person next to you and say, hey, wake up. Uh, God loves you. Good message coming. Uh, undeceivable. I've talked to you now for a few weeks. We've done nine of the ten points on how to be undeceivable. I hope you've got those series tucked away in your heart and mind or your iPod, your iPad, something so you can understand what it is that God expects of us as far as being undeceivable. Remember the Lord said, for false Christ and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. We got to make sure that is not possible. Say amen. We got to make sure it is not possible for you and I to be deceived. And so as we move through this final message, I want you to really hone in on your personal need not to be deceived. I wish that you could spend, and you can't because of confidential situations, but I wish you could spend some time with me between the Sundays. I wish that you could go in to the brokenness that I minister to on a weekly basis. I, I wish you could walk alongside of me. Again, people tend to be very private in those times, so you can't, so don't ask. <laughs> but I, I wish you could see, but I think you would understand a whole lot more of why I preach the way I preach if you could see the stuff that happens to people on a regular basis. When I, when I so often when I get up here and I, I try to speak to you, I, I'm really trying to say, let me help you avoid some stuff I had to deal with this week. Let me help you avoid some disasters that I've been ministering to. And you see, when we come to being deceived, those things don't have to happen if we will take our biblical bearings from the Lord. So let's get started. The undeceivable can tell friend from foe. The undeceivable can tell friend from foe. Jesus said that they will put you out of the synagogue or their assembly. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think that they're offering a service to God. Well, that's very relevant in our, in our culture, isn't it? When people are being blown up thinking that they're doing a, a service for God. They're killing people, but... When we don't understand friend from foe, however misguided the foe may be, and we try to reach out to them in friendship, which is totally different than reaching out in evangelism. Tell me you get that. When we try to reach out in friendship, we can expose ourselves to dangers that are incredible. In fact, uh, this is not in your notes, but you want to write this down and, and tweet it or Facebook it or whatever it is that you do with it to remember it. If you're like most people, the most devast the greatest, the biggest devastations in your life are going to come down to making just one mistake, trusting someone you shouldn't have. Most of us, when we've got some mileage on us, and we've got some scars on our hearts and our spirits and our lives, it all comes back to that one mistake, we trusted people we shouldn't have trusted. We trusted a person that we should not have trusted. Can I get an amen? And uh, it's in those times, friends, that we begin to realize that it is not a hallmark world out there. There is some real danger out there. And we've got to stop and think about what we're doing in relationship to our relationship to a world. When you think about it, the greatest deception... And let me pause before I continue this message and tell you, I have a problem. <laughs> I didn't say a theory. <laughs> I have a problem. 
and it keeps rising up to bite me. It keeps causing me throughout my adult life and, and the ministry, it continues to keep causing my heart to get broken and my spirit to get um, wounded. It's naivety. It's naivety. I tend to want to believe the best of people. Hello? Anybody with me? And I tend to want to think, and this is kind of the way I'm wired up, that if I would never do that to you, you would never do that to me. And that is so flawed. It's so flawed. It's so naive. And it is very spiritually unwise. My wife has often told me, my wife is, is home recovering. She had a little medical procedure at the end of the week. It's, it's not serious as far as life's change, uh, threatening, but it's serious in terms of pain. So uh, please excuse her for today. But she often say to me, Jeff, you're being naive. <laughs> Jeff, you're being naive. Open your eyes. You know, and I go, oh, no, 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 no. And later on I go, I'm sorry about that. I, I should have listened. You know, anybody know what I'm talking about? When you think about it, the greatest deception that will ever happen on this planet is misplaced trust. The world will trust the Antichrist when they shouldn't. That's the greatest example of mistrust there is. You see, the enemy would love for you to be careless with your trust because when you become careless with your trust, you become easy prey. When you just go out there trusting anyone on the face value, you become vulnerable and open to the viciousness and the hatefulness and, listen, the destruction of the enemy. Now, I'm going to have to kind of, uh, we're going to have to wrestle with some stuff today. Are you all right with that? We're going to have to wrestle with some stuff today. It's, it's not going to be those, those little fluffy cupcake sermons that I often preach. We're going to have to wrestle with some, some difficult things. I am not, please understand, I am not in any way saying that we are too good to touch the world. That we're too good to be in relationship with ungodly. I am not saying that. I'm talking about the spiritual vulnerabilities that the enemy can exploit. And we've got to wrestle with what the scripture says today. So before you take any notes, I want to challenge a common belief about Jesus. I just want to challenge it. Now I'm going to talk to you some here with stuff that's not in your notes. But you have plenty of room in your notes, right? Uh, to scribble some stuff down. I think uh, Tiffany did some last-minute add-ins, so maybe it'll come up on the screen, but it won't be in your notes because this is relatively uh, over the last couple of days where I've put this additional material in here. So allow me to challenge a common, in my opinion, misunderstanding of Scripture. People constantly say Jesus was a friend of sinners. And we love that Jesus was a friend of sinners. Let me challenge that for a moment. You see, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 19, and versions of this saying happen uh, all over the Gospels, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, they say, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the lawyers, they say, here is a glutton, here is a drunkard, here is a friend of tax collectors and sinners. They say, He's a glutton. Was Jesus a glutton? No. Was Jesus a drunkard? But we say, but he was a friend of the sinners. You see, the Bible doesn't say he was a friend of sinners. The Bible says that they said he was. Are you trucking with me before we or I have to compete with the rain? <laughs> I have to yell real loud if it starts raining on that metal roof, you know. The Bible says they said he's a drunkard. They said he's a glutton. They say he's a friend of sinners. It doesn't say that's true. It just says they said it was. You're struggling with this, Tim? I'm <laughs> trying to figure it out. There. Let me tell you something about the Bible. Listen very carefully. Check me out if you want. Check me out anyway. Are you listening? Jesus never turned to an unbeliever to fill a relational need. Jesus never turned 
to an unbeliever to fill a relational need. That idea is simply not biblical and it is dangerous spiritually. I tell you, it's not going to be a cupcake sermon. Jesus never entered the world of the unbeliever to find support for himself. Jesus entered the world of the unbeliever to be a light to that world. He never went there to get anything. He went there to give. To give light, to give truth. He never went there to build a support system. He never went there to find a mate. He never went there to find a friend. And the idea that we can do that and be okay is spiritually deadly. Come on. How do we keep friend and foe clearly identified in our minds? Let's try this. Are you guys okay? Are you just in deep thought or are you mad at me? I really need to know because I want to know whether I need to be mad at you too. Here's the first key. I'm, I'm giving advice. Young people, especially you guys, I want you to listen to this. Cody's going to be preaching this again tonight. <laughs> Not really. I just thought I would mess with him a minute. Uh, here we are in 1 Corinthians uh, at chapter 5, verse 33. Let me read the point to you. I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry, Tiffany. Examine the impact the relationship is having on your spiritual life. How do I know if this is a friend or a foe? First of all, examine the impact the relationship is having on your spiritual life. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. What does it say? Do not be misled. In other words, do not be deceived. Don't let anyone kid you, he says. Bad company corrupts good character. Right? And if you don't believe bad company corrupts good character, you're being deceived. That's what the Bible says. Man, I wish I had a support system here this morning. I wish I had an amen corner. Can I form one real quickly? I'll point at you. You say amen. You know. All right. All right. The Corinthians were suffering the destruction of their very foundation. In chapter 15, they're arguing over whether or not there's even a resurrection of the dead. In the middle of that dis discussion on whether or not the dead come back to life at the resurrection, it's like Paul just kind of scratches his head and looks around because they were living in this pagan culture. And he said, do not be misled. It almost seems completely out of context. He's trying to defend the resurrection of the dead. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. In other words, the beliefs of a pagan world had begun to come into the minds and hearts and lives of believers. Show me a person who used to be in the center of God's will. Show me a person who used to do the work of God. Show me a person who used to be excited about the work of God. And show me that person that is no longer there, and I will trace you back to a moment in their life when they joined in a relationship with someone who did not share their faith. When they got so intimately involved with an unbeliever that that system came into their spirit and everything that God was doing in them and through them began to be corrupted. Do not be deceived. Bad company does corrupt good character. Jesus never went to the world for relational support. He never went to the world for relationships, period. He went to the world to share the kingdom with the world. Amen. Wrestle with this for a moment. By the way, this is in the New Testament, what I'm going to read here, in case any of you are wondering. 
Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. The yoke straps you into a harness, a plow, alongside another person. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? What fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial or a demon? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, and God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, you know, you've heard me say, if you see a therefore, you should stop and ask what it's there for. On the basis of what he just said, therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. And touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I'll be a father to you, and you'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, since there is simply no compatibility, young people, if you wind up married to someone who does not love Jesus, your life is going to become something you never dreamed it would become. Imagine the devil is trying to destroy your home and your spouse is helping. Amen. Imagine you're trying to raise kids up that know and love the Lord and your spouse is fighting you every step of the way. Imagine you would like to model the righteous morality of God in your home and your spouse is absolutely opposing you. Imagine you want to walk together in faith and fellowship and spiritual as well as physical intimacy and your spouse can't even enter that realm. She may be beautiful, but if she doesn't love the Lord, run. He may have bulging biceps and a six-pack abs I'm talking about. He may be able to speak with a golden tongue and make you feel like Miss Universe. Here's something I used to say to my girls, and they loved it so much. If you find every woman's dream, he will be your nightmare. Run. Find the guy that loves Jesus. And he will know how to love you. Find a guy who knows how to follow Jesus and he'll know how to lead you. You miss it here. And you've sentenced yourself to years of the worst kind of loneliness and struggle you can imagine. Young people, am I making any sense? Old people, am I making any sense? I'm having fun even though you're not. I love the way you're twitching a little bit. Got to be careful how I say this, but I always think of when Abraham and his nephew parted company, they've gotten a, a squabble, and the Bible says that Lot, the nephew, pitched his tents Careful how you say that. <laughs> Pitched his tents near Sodom, you know. That's in Genesis. Stop it. <laughs> he, he 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 set up his tents uh, near Sodom when they parted company. That's in chapter thirteen. In chapter 14, the next time we see Lot, he's living in Sodom. When you try to camp near it, you wind up living in it. And Lot lost his family. He lost his wife. He survived by the skin of his teeth, an exodus out of it. But his family was destroyed. If we think 
we can become intimate with a fallen world without falling ourselves we deceive ourselves if we think we can be intimate with a fallen world without falling ourselves we deceive ourselves i'm not saying we're too good for them you understand that please understand that i'm not saying we're cut above we are sinners saved by grace no better than anybody else but there is there are spiritual realities in this world and one of them is that when we are following God with a clean heart and a pure life we have to walk that out in our relationships and everyone said amen Amen. number two give the person grace but do not excuse me give the person grace but not a pass when it comes to lifestyle How many understand what that that means? Yeah. We have a thing we call red flags. Boy, I saw that red flag. And over and over again. I I sit down with people in my office who are in a a relational crisis or in a a marital failure, and we start talking about how did we get here, and, and constantly I hear this, I saw the red flags, but I ignored them. I saw the red flags, but I ignored them. You see, every time I have mistaken, and I have, every time I have mistaken a foe for a friend, I did it by ignoring red flags. I did it by seeing things that didn't quite fit, and I thought, well, I I must be misunderstanding that. I saw things that weren't biblically right, but I gave them a pass. I thought, well, surely I'm not seeing or hearing what I think I am. When I was in college 150 years ago, (laughs) there was this young professor who was sort of the cool guy on campus. He had everything going on, he and his young wife, and they were kind of the college favorites. And for some some reason, uh, I wound up being pretty good friends with this guy, and and I was in his language classes. He was a Harvard man, and I was just honored to, to be in, in, in his circle of friends, and, and we hung out some together. In fact, I was preaching in church in the area, and he'd come and preach for me. He'd preach, and I mean, he was, seemed to be such a, an awesome guy. And uh, I, one of those people you, you hook up to, and you think, this is the kind of guy I want to be like. But I can remember at times in conversations, red flags, red flags, red flags coming up. And uh, there came a day. When uh, I got the call that my friend had just been um, exposed by his wife for having multiple affairs and all kinds of ungodly stuff going on in his life. And I remember I was sitting in a service when I heard it, and, and I immediately just began to weep. A, a hero had, had just profoundly disappointed me. And then my mind went back of all those red flags all the things I saw that I should have said, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. Every time I have been profoundly hurt or disappointed by someone, it has been by ignoring red flags. Do not give people a pass when it comes to biblical standards. Amen? Do not give people a pass. If you ignore them, it will be a problem down the road. Number three, honor the established voices of spiritual counsel. Honor the established voices of spiritual counsel. They're not perfect, but they're there for a reason. Around your life, there are voices of spiritual counsel. There's people who speak into your life, right? There's people who who speak to you good, positive things. And I don't know how it goes with you, but every once in a while, people step into my life and say, Hey, Jeff, be careful. I don't feel right about that. That I'm concerned about what's going on there. I I think you should stop and pray about that some more. Or I think you should watch that situation. There's something amiss there. And I have a choice to make as to whether or not I'm going to listen to the established voices in my life. The established voices of spiritual counsel. Young people, please listen to me. Please listen to me. Please listen to me. 
the people who are more mature than you that have been circling your life and speaking to you and you've enjoyed their wisdom, don't reject those voices when you don't like what they say. As a father, I'm going to start a movement that dads get to pick their, ch their kids' spouses again. Those marriages almost never fail. Arranged marriages. Of course, you get executed if you divorce. That helps, you know. But you know, you know, and maybe this is only a parental thing, but you know what it is when your kid brings someone into your house and all the alarms go off in your spirit. Come on. Ugh. Oh, something's wrong. And there, there have been times when my kids were teenagers and not yet had not yet grown a brain. Um, you know, uh, they'd bring company over, and after I'd leave, I'd say, uh, that person's not going to hang around here anymore. Why not? I don't know why. I just know that in my spirit, everything is crying. There's something wrong. There's something wrong here. And there, you're not allowed in that relationship. All I know is that the Holy Spirit is saying, this is dangerous, and I'm going to go with him. Oh, Dad. But when you ignore that voice, you live to regret it. It even works with grandkids. It does. Sometimes I walk into the grandkids' birthday parties and I go, you know, my daughter, hey, keep them away from that kid right there. That kid right there, if you look real close, there's a 666 right across the forehead. If you can't see it, you haven't prayed enough. But that kid, that kid's bad news. That kid's is a hand to the enemy in the lives of my grandkids. Please, be careful about that. And how many times have we seen it? People who have been walking in the spiritual counsel of mature believers, when they need that counsel the most, they run from it. They ignore it, or they get offended by it. When someone comes up and says, wait, wait, there's something wrong here. I, I don't bear witness that this is, this is God's plan for you. And, of course, they don't know because they were on the ark when it landed. What could they know about your life? You know? But, again, I can go back over my life and see the times when I have been deceived and hurt by people and at times, it even brought pain into churches we've pastored. And I have to go back then after that thing has, has, has run its course and you've survived the battle and picked yourself up. I have to go back to people and say, I'm sorry, I should have listened to you. I'm sorry, you had their number from the beginning, but I wouldn't hear it. I'm sorry. I wish I had listened to you. I wish I had heard what you were saying. And the disaster is so often, friends, when you reject the established voice of spiritual counsel is that you bring all kinds of devastation into your life. Are you guys ready to go to the next point? Is it because you're enjoying this so much you can't wait for the next trumpet to sound? The next seal to be opened? All right, number four, do not become uncomfortable with spiritual accountability. Do not become uncomfortable with spiritual accountability. You see, the path of disappointment, let me change that, the path of disobedience, which will result in disappointment, but the path of disobedience to God rejects accountability. People who are walking on the path of disobedience, they love those passages, don't judge me. They love that. Because really, they're not saying, don't judge me. They're saying, don't hold me accountable. Don't expect anything better of me. Don't expect me to model what I've been taught. Don't expect me to do what I've told other people to do. So they're saying, do not hold me accountable. But when we become uncomfortable with accountability, that should be all kinds of warning signs going off in our minds. I should stop right now. 
Because if you're in a relationship that people have to stop and say, wait, where's that going? Or if you're involved in something that people are not comfortable with, the people who love you and love the Lord, then you should be able to say, you know, speak to me. What is God saying? And, and I will prayerfully listen to what it is that you feel that God has laid upon your heart. I, ultimately, it's my call, but I, I, I am very interested in what you're saying. A person who has surrendered to God embraces the accountability that, he's, that God has placed in their life. Amen. Number five, always remember that a future apology will never restore what was lost. When I've been deceived, and it has resulted in pain and sometimes broken relationships with people that didn't deserve it, I've never been able to apologize and undo it. I could apologize and get grace, but I could never go back and undo that. I could never restore what was lost. You see, friends, when you choose to walk under the influence of the world, you're choosing to hurt those who have depended on you to have the influence of God on your life. When you begin to set a bad example, you are letting down the people who trusted you to set a good example. Are you walking this out with me? And you can never undo that. I, you know, we want to fix it as much as we can. While there's grace, there's no undoing. So, when I allow influences to come into my life, I have to understand that that influence may create consequences that hurt other people, and, and those consequences will, will be there for a while. It means I've got to rebuild my, my reputation with that per, those people. I've got to rebuild my influence with those people. I've got to start all over and try to come back. And number six, be a person of genuine heart-level prayer. We used to have a judge in northwest Arkansas many years ago. They called him the hanging judge. His, his name slips my mind. Uh, but he basically say, we're going to have trial at 8 o'clock in the morning and we'll hang him at noon. You don't get the problem with that? He knew before the trial started they were going to get hung at noon. Come on, you guys are slow today, aren't you? Yeah, no. And I say that to say this, is that when you are in an unhealthy or a corrupting relationship, you're keeping your distance from God. You may pray, but you're careful to get out of the way before God starts talking. God bless this day, God bless this, God bless Joe, God bless Sam, God bless Ann, God bless, 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 all right, see you later. Because we don't want to stay there long enough for the Holy Spirit to say, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? Pay attention. You're allowing things to come into your life that you know shouldn't be there. What are you doing? And sometimes, friends, when we want something so badly, we refuse to hear God say, that's not good for you. We refuse to hear God say, I have something better for you. And so we run from it. When I was... A teenager and coming up through the, what they call the formative years, I guess. My greatest fear in life would be that I would marry the wrong person. My greatest fear. Because this is going to be a very big revelation to many of you. Teenage boys are focused on the appearance of girls.
And so you could see a beautiful young lady and you'd convince God. Oh, God, you know, that must be my future wife that you're bringing into my life. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You know. But I lived in fear that I would marry the wrong person. It had my attention. And so I prayed right up to the moment of, of being married, God, if this is not you, please intervene and change the direction we're going. Everybody I dated, God, please show me, is this your will or not? Because I had seen so much marital dysfunction. I had seen so much unhappiness in marriages. I knew the last thing in the world I ever wanted to do was be in that situation myself. I'll tell you something. I know this, this message has been a lot to the young people. Because by the time you get a few decades on you like Tim Liberty here. You've kind of figured this out, and you're not really out there developing friendships that are going to corrupt you, are you, Tim? You, you, you kind of hang around godly people, and, you know, that's because you're a godly person, and you attract God, you know, you know. But if you're young, and especially if you're young and single, there's all kinds of influences going on, and it is so profoundly important that when you connect with someone for relational support and relational fulfillment, that it's not someone that will corrupt you. I'm not saying you're better than them. I'm saying you are fundamentally different. What fellowship hath light with darkness? What fellowship is there between God and the devil? What fellowship is there between God and an idol? I'm simply saying to you that if the Bible is true, you are fundamentally incompatible with an unbeliever. Fundamentally incompatible with an unbeliever. At the most intimate level, you are incompatible. And you see, this is that area where you are probably most likely to be deceived. You see, the undeceivable walk around with a healthy suspicion. Are you really what you say you are? Are you really who you say you are? I want to tell you something. I don't know how this got off here, but it's amazing what you'll say under the anointing. Let's say, young people, got some young people back here, up here, everywhere. Uh, you're dating someone. They're not really following the Lord. You're just dating them. You're just going out and having a Coke, Diet Coke, Diet Dr. Pepper. On all those really, really adventurous nights, a real Dr. Pepper. There has to come that conversation where you say, hey, this relationship can't go any further. I'm following Jesus. If you want to come and follow Jesus with me, great. If you don't, I'm going another direction. And then, for God's sakes, give it enough time to see if it was true. If someone wants to say, yes, I, I see God in you, I see God, I, I want that life too. But the most important thing you'll ever find in a mate or a close friend is spiritual compatibility. If you're going to walk close to me as my friend, I want you to know Jesus. I want there to be some substance in this friendship. I want you to hang on to me when I'm weak. And if I'm being tempted, I want you to speak strength and wisdom into me. 
I don't want you to pull me down in the gutter. I need you to prop me up. Come on. And then God does something really, really, really incredible. He creates relationships that stand the test of time. I've got friendships that have spanned decades. Amen. I got a marriage that is, in a few short years, will will hit 40. This summer will be the big 37, you know. You you find it, it doesn't mean you don't have challenges along the way. It just means that fundamentally you're compatible. Fundamentally you're on the same page. Fundamentally you're going the same direction. I'm kind of worried. A little bit worried. Because every week, I pick up the pieces of people who didn't get this. Every week. Every week, I hug little kids whose mom and dad are going in the opposite directions. Every week, I try to, with God's help, mend gaping wounds in people's spirits. Simply because they could not tell friend from foe. They could not see what the devil was up to. And they found themselves neck deep in a situation that corrupted them. Can I give you some fatherly advice today? Wake up. Wake up. Someday you'll stand before God. And he will either say, well done, or what in the heck happened to you? You were doing so well. The devil used to face every morning afraid of you. And then he got you through that relationship. This sermon has got all kinds of dangerous potential if it's taken out of context of what I'm saying. And I hope it's not. I hope you understand. You've got to wrestle with what Paul said to the Corinthians. Bad company corrupts good character. End of subject. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Don't touch it. It's unclean. Don't touch it. And it'll make you unclean. It'll, it'll separate you from God. You won't be able to go into the presence of God because of the uncleanness that has come upon your soul through that. I, I know i got to quit, but again, you, you're going to make some big decisions here that April the 30th, 2017 is just going to live on in your life and either it's going to be a pivotal moment where you figured it out Or it's going to be the time when you ignore the message that could have saved your life. Maybe your soul. That's the weight I feel right now. Will you bow your heads with me, please?